And if you sense something is wrong, you can go to that other person and say, I'm not asking you to confide in me. All I want to say is I sense that something's not right. And I just wanted to let you know that I recognize that. And if you ever do want to speak to me, I'm here to listen. That goes a long way in how we deal with relationships, not just in life, but at work. Because when you're not functioning at work, forget it. It's not going to work out. In this episode, host Edith and her guest Dan Smolin talk about entrepreneurship, what it's like to start and grow a business, and the importance of meaningful work. Hi folks, I'm your host Edith Richards, and you may know me from my podcast series, Myers-Briggs Question Corner, or my website, atopcareer.com. I've spent the last 20 years of my career helping people get smart about their careers. And I've found that lots of smart people aren't successful. Why is that? I'm convinced it's due to emotional intelligence. In EQ at Work, I'm bringing you inspiring people and messages to help you get smart about your emotions. It's well known that emotional intelligence is linked to job satisfaction. Many studies have shown correlation between high EQ and high workplace satisfaction. We all know that in today's world, people expect something deeper than a paycheck in return for their efforts. They expect meaning in their jobs. With us today to talk about the link between meaningful work, entrepreneurship, and emotional intelligence is Dan Smolin. Dan is a veteran executive recruiter turned nationally recognized thought leader in workforce and workplace topics. Now he is the host and executive producer of the Dan Smolin podcast, which helps listeners navigate the future of work to do truly meaningful work. You can subscribe to the Dan Smolin podcast on a variety of channels, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Dan, I have got to admit that I feel like we're switching roles here. Finally, I'm interviewing you for a change. You've had quite an interesting career, which I'm a bit in awe of, especially how you've made the leap from quote unquote worker to entrepreneur. And I think a lot of folks tuning in today are going to be interested to hear not only how you made that leap, but what you learned along the way. But let's start with an easy question. How would you describe your professional self? Well, first off, Edith, what a delight to be on a podcast with you where I am the guest and you're the host. I know, right? It's really exciting for me too. Well, you asked an interesting question. How I answer that is I believe I help people in the workforce to real-time imagine work for themselves that is profound, protects the planet, empowers people and communities, and it's fun to do, meaningful work. Beyond that, I report on how the future of work is becoming present in our lives, in our sudden pivot away from what is often called co-located work, which is working with other people in an office setting. We're shifting to more remote work and hybrid work environments, and that is happening right now in 2021. So I feel like I'm getting back to my reporter roots describing how these future of work changes are becoming present tense. Yeah, and there sure have been a lot of changes um, over the past year. And it really begs the question, what is the future of work going to look like? And I'd like to ask you a question about your career progression before we get into the kind of nitty gritty of that. Can you talk about your career progression? Because you certainly didn't start out as an entrepreneur, nor did you start out, I think, seeking to become an advocate for meaningful work. But how did you know that you didn't want to work in a traditional nine to five kind of job? Well, I didn't know that initially. And I think it's why I had a four act progression in my careers. You asked me to take you through it, and I'll gladly do that. Back in college, I started as an on-air reporter, 
And previous to that, I was a scholastic journalist in high school in Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. So I thought I was going to be a journalist, either in print or on radio. I loved radio. I loved the intimacy of it. And as a college student, I got good at it. I was on the air quite a bit. And I thought that that was going to be what I would do for a career. Uh, It didn't happen. As I graduated college in a really terrible economy, I was encouraged to get into advertising and marketing. And that was my second career act. I spent several years in the ad agency space representing some very top clients in both their marketing and account management needs. And imagine, if you will, I was a 27-year-old guy with a lot of ambition and not a lot of experience and a tremendous amount of responsibility. But as they say, nothing lasts forever. And then I went into my third act, which was probably my longest so far. And that was a 20-year stint in executive recruitment. The first seven years working for a woman named Victoria James, who I actually worked for during my second act in the agency space. And then I decided seven years in that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to go at this on my own. So I hung my own shingle and I started my own recruitment agency. And I did that for 13 years and it was very successful at it. Can I ask you what actually, you said that you wanted to become an entrepreneur. Why did you want to become an entrepreneur? What was it? Was there something that you were dissatisfied with in the quote unquote traditional workspace? Or was it just kind of an idea that you had? Well, I think some of it was latent in my DNA. I love solving problems. I actually liked having a business. I liked the responsibility of creating and sustaining something that had the benefit of helping others. Mm, Nice. Well, that's great. And then I guess as an entrepreneur, you could probably do that more to um, the parameters of kind of what you thought was meaningful, just to start to pivot into meaningful work there. That would probably just having your, your own agency would probably tick that box a little more than working for someone else. I wanted to add one thing, though, because that was my third act. And I figured, oh, okay, I can do this the rest of my life. I can be a recruiter. I can live anywhere. When you are a recruiter, you can work virtually and have mobile technology. And, you know, my wife dreamed years ago of retiring on on a Capri, which is the top of the Isle of Capri (laughs) outside of Italy. (laughs) Yeah. And I was like, how would I do that? But I could have. I didn't stay a recruiter. About three years ago, I reached a point where the success measures were going retrograde. I was very good at retaining people in their work and allowing them to find opportunities to be happy. But what was happening to me was that the clients that I had were great people. I loved them. Unfortunately, the assignments that I was getting from them and the culture in their companies was growingly discordant. What I mean by that is I would put somebody in a position that was, let's say, a business development manager, which has some elements of marketing and planning involved. What I discovered is that my clients really wanted was pure salespeople and not the hunter-gatherer type, the type that works off of the phone and calls people cold calling. I mean, nobody really cold calls anymore, but that's what they wanted. And oftentimes I was getting reachbacks from my place clients saying, Dan, I'm miserable. I never really had that. But I know we're talking about emotional intelligence on this episode. (laughs) And I had to tap into that and say, wait a minute, what is going on here? And am I contributing to their misery? And I had to make a decision, Edith. And the decision was, I either double down, try to find some new clients, keep at recruiting, Or I had had to ask myself, is this the time to exit out and do something else? Mm. And I took the road less traveled, Mm -hmm. as you know, Mm -hmm. which pivoted me into my fourth act, which is being a podcaster and a thought leader around the areas of future of work and meaningful work. So that's how I've come full circle in my career. And now I'm dealing with the issues that I never dealt with as a recruiter, because as a recruiter, you're hired by the hiring manager. 
they are the ones calling the shots. Right. Now I am talent focused. I am people focused and I'm trying to respond to people in a way that helps them direct more purpose and more enjoyment out of their careers and hopefully by extension their lives. Yeah, let's hope so. And I have no doubt that you're doing that for a lot of people. And, you know, speaking of that, kind of making that pivot between working for the hiring manager versus working for the talent, I can't help but think about this disconnect there is between, you know, what the leaders of these organizations think is important and what people are trying to do to create meaning in their own space. It just seems like this disconnect is bigger than ever now. And I would have thought that the times we're living in would have minimized that a bit, but I personally don't see that happening. Do you? That's an interesting question. I actually think that the tumult that we are dealing with right now is uncovering these things. I'll give you an example. Sometimes a hiring manager would say to me, Dan, I want you to go out. This is a cache organization. I want you to go out and find me people who only have Ivy League backgrounds. Now, when I say Ivy League backgrounds, I'm not talking about Cornell. I want uh, either Harvard or Yale <laughs> or Wharton School of Business. <laughs> okay. And I think about it and I say, all right, fine. Then I would discover that's that person's pedigree. Why are they hiring themselves? Right. If you're going to hire somebody, why don't you hire somebody? who brings a completely different value set, because maybe hiring you is the problem. Yeah, we see this all the time in the corporate world. People, they don't always have this awareness of what they need on their teams. They need someone else who has a different skill set. We all can't be good at everything, right? We can't all be good at everything, but I think that emotional intelligence plays into this because It takes somebody really EQ strong to say, maybe I got to hire somebody completely different from me stylistically, background wise. If I'm a white guy, maybe a woman of color, maybe somebody from a different scholastic background and a different life experience background. Because when we tend to hire ourselves, you know, maybe we perpetuate some good aspects, maybe. I find somebody who, like me, is a strong hunter sales type who knows how to drive revenue and scale, revenue scale. Maybe I'm perpetuating all the bad habits. Maybe I'm ignoring market opportunities because I only know what I know and I don't know what I don't know. That's a great way to put it because when we're talking about emotional intelligence, I mean, it takes someone who not only is aware of their own strengths and weaknesses and is able to use that when they're, you know, in this case, sourcing candidates, but also has that level of self-regard that they're not threatened by someone who has a different skill set than they do. What would you say to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree with you. You know, I spent a tremendous amount of my career in the advertising space, which couldn't have been more white and more male. (laughs) And the sensibilities, even the management tropes were usually around competitive sports. Get on the team. Uh Don't sit on the bench. (laughs) You know, get a little dirty in the playground, you know. (sighs) And how has that changed today? Well, it's changing. I don't know that it's changed. I think this is the opportunity this decade. Yeah. With a distributed workforce, perhaps we are able to bring on people into kinds of work that they would not normally have been able to do because they had to travel too far or they had some something in the way, maybe childcare or, you know, some other hindrance. I'm hoping that we get smarter about hiring all kinds of people for all kinds of work Mm -hmm. and not be afraid of it. Let it liberate us. Think about if we bring in new kinds of people, they may actually open up new markets for us, or they will think about the execution of a plan differently that will create better and perhaps even different outcomes that we've never thought about. And I think the old school of management tends to be very, well, very white and very hierarchical. Control, right? And I'd like, 
<laughs> Indeed. And I'd like to see more bottom up ideation because you know what? Sometimes the, the man or woman or person on the factory floor has the best ideas. No kidding. But the, the question then becomes, how do you get these leaders at the top to buy into this? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a rhetorical question. No, I, I, I think you hire more <laughs> women. You purpose yourself to make sure that you're not hiring, that you're not considering hiring people of color and differing backgrounds and experiences. Mm. I mean, I think about, and I don't remember the gentleman's name, the CEO of Lowe's Corporation, which is in the home improvement business. They compete against Home Depot. African-American gentleman with a very interesting backstory, grew up poor, suffered a lot of discrimination, and yet he's running one of the most amazing companies out there. And he's reimagining it for the 21st century. Now, it's not a knock on Home Depot. This is because this man brings this set of experiences that are so unlike what you typically see among blue chip companies in the United States. Uh And my hope is by breaking the old culture paradigms and creating new ones, work is going to change. How we use emotional intelligence at work is going to be liberated because we're going to have all these new perspectives in place that are going to be fresh and free us from the old. I don't know how else to put it, but I think it's a real opportunity. Mm, I definitely agree with you there because when we're talking about emotional intelligence, there's just so many misconceptions about what it is. And I love that example that you just gave because it shows how someone has used this element of flexibility to work for him and to grow his business. And speaking of emotional intelligence, you've, you've taken the EQI assessment. So you are familiar with all of these elements of emotional intelligence and also where your natural tendencies lie. Mm. What does emotional intelligence mean to you and how does it relate to both your career and, you know, where you think that the world is going? Well, let's start with me. I think it means that I can get into most any situation and read the room, read what is going on, read what people are saying, feel what the room is telling me in terms of energy, but also intent, and respond in a way that creates forward progress. So what does that mean? I especially learned this in recruiting. Oftentimes you are dealing with competing interests. How do you get a candidate who's one way and a hiring manager who says it's got to be another way And how do you find the bridges in their divide? And I think I learned that from emotional intelligence. Part of it is just sitting back and listening and seeing what bubbles up. Because oftentimes we hear words, but we don't hear intent. And so sometimes it takes a little time to bridge that divide. But I think EQ has helped me get to that point. And my success or lack of success comes from active listening, but also from my intuition, which I think is very strong. Yeah, I can be in a room and I can feel an energy. Sometimes it's from a micro expression or a nonverbal expression. And I can see, uh uh-oh, I've hit a touch point. Back off or redirect. So here's a question for you about that, because I think a lot of people tuning in, they might hear what you're saying, but they might not have such a strong intuition as you do. So how do you gauge whether you're right or wrong, I guess is the question I want to ask here. I had a situation many, many years ago before I was recruiting in the agency space. And one of our team members just had a look on her face as if the bottom had dropped off. And I'm sitting watching in the meeting and and, and immediately I knew something was wrong because she was completely different in her demeanor. She was usually a very outgoing person, Uh but I could see there was something there was something different. I felt this energy. She, she looked hollow, like desiccated. <laughs> I don't know how to uh-huh. explain it. We weren't close friends, but I pulled her aside and I said, so-and-so, I sense that something's going on with you and I'm not prying, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm sensing it and I feel for you. And if there's something that I could do, would you please let me know? Would you, would you do that? I'm here to listen, not judge. And she nodded and went away and I figured, okay, 
That's fine. Mm -hmm. And about three days later, she came to me and she said, my husband just filed divorce <laughs> on me. Oh, wow. And this was the love of my life. Oh. And, and it's rocked my world. And I don't know how to get through the day. And she, you know, she wasn't returning phone calls and she wasn't this and wasn't that. And I think not requiring her to respond, but me to say, I feel it yeah. was a breakthrough moment, which I think back in those days probably didn't happen very much because, you know, when we deal with grief at work, it's often, you know, bucket up, you know, take the day off to go deal with your problems and come back, yeah. you know, hitting the ground hard. But this poor woman, I mean, this was her, I don't know if it was a college sweetheart or a high school sweetheart, dude left, moved out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the circumstances were, but this woman's grief was so palpable that it directed me away from all the other things I had to deal with because I could see one of my team members was suffering. Yeah. And she didn't work for me. She worked with me. And that's sort of how I use intuition. It's not a secret power. I think that many people have intuitive strengths. Mine tend to be very heightened, but I think most people have some degree of it. And if you sense something is wrong, you can go to that other person and say, I'm not asking you to confide in me. All I want to say is I sense that something's not right. And I just wanted to let you know that I recognize that. And if you ever do want to speak to me, I'm here to listen. That goes a long way in how we deal with relationships, not just in life, but at work. Because when you're not functioning at work, forget it. It's not going to work out. Yeah, you're bringing up such a pivotal point here to me, because as you know, I am a very relationship centric person. And I truly believe this, that relationships drive everything that we do. And when we're talking about relationships at work, we have to have relationships with people. We have to get along with people. We have to work together on a team. We have to influence people and we have to produce together. And that's what's going to drive our progress. And if we don't, then, you know, we're, we're missing, we're not just missing out on an opportunity today. We're missing out on marketplace revenue and, and such. And which is why I really like that example of the story, because I think at work, especially so many people aren't tuned in to other people's emotions. And if we can just pause for a moment and see how is somebody showing up here? And is this different than how this person normally shows up? And just the fact that you took her aside privately and said, you know, I, I'm not here to judge, but I'm here. That certainly had to have gone a long way, not just for her, but for the work that she was producing and for your team. Indeed. Now, mind you, this was a long time ago. Let's put the focus on the present 2021. So we're reaching a nearly one year mark of lockdowns and virtual work and not being in the physical presence of other people, not being tactile, not being able to hug or shake hands. Add to that the fact that many of us have experienced profound loss of loved ones in the past year or know people who have lost loved ones. I happen to have lost my mother-in-law. It was traumatic. Oh, that's terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, thank you. She lived in your town, Edith, and uh, we couldn't say goodbye to her. There are people who don't really understand how completely mind-blowing the loss of a loved one to COVID is because all of the normal rituals of passing and saying goodbye don't happen. How did we say goodbye? Over a speakerphone. Couldn't even get uh, Zoom to work in the hospital, so we had to do it over a, an iPhone speakerphone. We couldn't even look at her. Couldn't attend her funeral. It was too dangerous at the time. This happened back in May, and um, we're in the Washington, D.C. area, and we weren't able to travel to New York State to bury her and have a funeral. So we had to do it over Zoom. That's like a new thing now, the Zoom funeral. And I'm Jewish. And in the Jewish tradition for seven days, you do what's called sit shiva. It's a period of mourning where people come to your residence and they pay their respects to you. Yeah. Well, you can't do that. So there was no shiva. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, imagine having no wake or memorial period after the person has passed. It was very strange and very unsettling. And I think to your listeners who have never encountered this, put yourselves in the space of people who have been profoundly changed by the sudden loss of a loved one, 
without the normal means of expression to grow from the loss. That takes a tremendous well of emotional intelligence to do. And I'm hopeful that if we can talk about it, for those people who I'm pleased have not lost a loved one, they've been safe or maybe just been lucky, that they can recognize the profound pain of losing a loved one in such a way, you know, knowing that that person passed away alone or whatever. I think this is a tremendous growing and learning opportunity for us all, I think, in 2021. Very much so, because how it affects one person is not necessarily going to be how it affects someone else. And really to truly appreciate that other person's perspective, you have to find a way to step outside of yourself. And that's, it's not always easy to do, but it is very much what we need during these times. Indeed. Yeah. I thank you, Dan, for, for sharing that story. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. It must be just a terrible time for your family to have gone through that. And I'm wondering about your entrepreneurship ventures too. How has the last year affected the work you do? What's really interesting, you know, think back to when you were in college, Edith, and you thought about what you were going to do. It was a singular thing, right? You know, I want to be a teacher or I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to run a business or I want to be an advertising and be a, you know, be a creator. Mm -hmm. What 2021 has done, what I think has made the future of work present in so many ways is that what we do for work is not singular anymore. It can be an amalgam of experiences. And that's what gets to me. I am a podcaster. I'm building a bigger brand around that podcast, which is thought leadership to get us to do more meaningful work for ourselves and and achieve more happiness for ourselves. But beyond my enterprise is all the things that I do with my wife. We run several vintage clothing businesses online on things like Poshmark and on, you know, Etsy and things like that. And uh, it's a tremendous amount of work, but very fulfilling. On top of that, my wife and I do investment together. Mm -hmm. So the idea of side hustles, I think is going to become very normalized this year. Mm -hmm. I see it in my own family. My wife is a full-time school teacher. And yet in her off hours, when she's off the clock, she's got this whole other world that brings her great joy. It you know, the, the items that she curates to sell and, you know, beyond the uh, the online sales, she also has uh, some antique stores in the Northern Virginia suburbs where she sells merchandise. So we have a full life around a lot of different entrepreneurial pursuits, which is really kind of fun. Yeah, it's really interesting what you said, because uh, I think this prediction was made long ago. And I had this in my head. I've had it in my head for years that how we are working is changing. And I think it's been slowly changing for years, but this past year has really just kind of taken it into overdrive and changed the hours that we put in, how we work. It's very interesting that you're wearing all of these hats. And I agree with you. I think we're going to see more and more of this as time goes on. And I want to have, as we are kind of starting to close out here, I'm very interested in your answer to this question. What advice do you have? for people who are considering entrepreneurship? Well, first of all, find something that you are absolutely passionate about, that you're knowledgeable about, or think about something that provides a solution to a problem that you think you can solve. And on top of that, make a little money. But here's the, here's the but. Don't give up your day job. If you've got a job that's paying you a steady paycheck and providing benefits, Don't walk away from that to start a sole proprietorship of some kind. That is just nutty. Find a way to side hustle your idea. Like my wife, my wife teaches full-time in school. She gets a great salary and benefits. And at the night she does her side hustle. It's a win-win. And that way you still have the benefit of your paycheck and your health insurance, but you can turn this thing into something rewarding. It can become a passion project that over time grows And maybe you reach a point where you say, I'm making so much money, or I am so satisfied doing this that I'm going to give up my day job. I can afford to do it. It's very important to balance out the passion with the practicality. Don't give up your day job. Don't fall into economic despair. 
but find things that you can do on a smaller scale. That's why I call them side hustles that will provide you joy. Maybe you do them during evening hours or on the weekends. You know, a lot of people have turned to crafting. Yeah. They're making things now. They're joining maker movements, building furniture and clocks and doing floral displays or like my wife making jewelry mm. or selling vintage jewelry. That's a side hustle. It doesn't take away the motion lotion, the, the money that you're making to pay the bills and perhaps put away money for your retirement. But on the other hand, it allows you to live your dreams because, you know, maybe you have, maybe your main job is just okay. And maybe you don't have the means to create added meaning to it, meaning to do volunteer efforts, if that's what you want to do, or make your job greener and more clean. So find ways outside of that professional experience to create something all your own and own it and learn how to do it at the best that you can. And most importantly, just be blissful about it and enthusiastic about it. Because if you're selling things to other people, it's your enthusiasm, which is the gateway to the benefits and the utility of the products or services that you are selling. Just be blissful and be enthusiastic. And that's how I think we're going to find joy in doing work in the future is by oftentimes creating side hustles that augment the daily reality of a job that's just sort of okay, but it's paying the bills. I hear you there. I mean, I think we all deserve to be blissful and enthusiastic with what we're doing. Dan, what is coming up for you in the next few months? What are you working on now? Well, I think 2021 is going to be an amazing year for me. I am lining up brand new guests who were talking about how they are impacting the future of work. We are going to have people on who, in the next week or so, who will talk about, you know, how to design the perfect space for your Zoom room, you know, for those of us working at home. So it's getting beyond the, the kind of recruitment questions that I used to deal with and more of a lifestyle play because life and work are so enmeshed now. Mm -hmm. I am leveraging old skills as a talk show segment producer to weave new stories to help people visualize how the future of work is going to play out in their own lives. And I think with that, Edith, the next few months are going to be very exciting. The new guests we bring on, you know, beyond the podcast, I'm hoping to write another book. I got to get that started. I think I've got a lot of really great stories to tell about how we are pursuing future of work opportunities and also striving for meaningful work. And I am going to take a very serious look at my brand, which we call the Dan Smolin experience to see, you know, how we can monetize it better. And more importantly, how we bring more value to people so that it's a destination people can come to and say, I want to learn more about ways that I can make the work that I do more joyful and more meaningful for me. Mm, nice. Thank you. So, and speaking of that, where can uh, listeners get in touch with you? Well, I'm at dansmolen.com. That's D-A-N-S-M-O-L-E-N.com. That's my website. And uh, right there are all my podcast episodes if you want to scroll through them. We also have blog posts. And if you join up with us, you can get our quarterly newsletter and other things that are going to come in the future. For podcast listeners, search for my name, Dan Smolen. We're on all the channels. Oh, one thing we just did, we launched a podcast app which for people that just hate searching podcast channels for our show becomes a very easy way to listen and it updates beautifully. It's, um, it's not a perfect tool, but it's going to get better over the future and it's simple and easy to use. And if you're on, uh, if you use an iPhone, uh, you can go to the app store, the Apple app store, put in my name, Dan Smolin and ding, there it is. And it's free. Excellent. And so you can find me there. You can find me on Twitter at Dan Smolin. I am on Instagram at dan.smolin. And on LinkedIn, of course, I'd love to hear from your listeners. And thank you, Edith. I've enjoyed this. This has been great. Oh, well, I really appreciate you being here, Dan. Thank you so much. It is just a pleasure to hear about somebody who is doing such good in the world. So thank you for that. Thank you for all you do for other people to help them navigate meaningful work. I do want to add one thing, though, for if you're going to look at my website, Put Edith Richards in the search bar and you'll bring up some of the podcast episodes that I did with Edith. She's one of our most popular podcast uh, <laughs> guests that we've had over the years. And 
You can listen to Edith taking me through my EQ assessment. That would be interesting. Or my Myers-Briggs assessment, which is really, really interesting. So thank you so much, Edith. Oh, sure. Those were a lot of fun for me too. So thanks again, Dan. Really appreciate you being here and all the best to you in 2021. I'm sure I'll be talking to you again soon. Back at you, my friend. Have a great 2021. Thanks so much. Take care. Dan talked about many different aspects of emotional intelligence that have helped to shape his career, including empathy, problem solving, interpersonal relationships, and of course, optimism. But there's one more that I'd like to cite, and it's an element that we often underestimate, but one that is so vital during these uncertain times, and that's flexibility. This is our ability and tendency to adapt to life's challenges to unpredictable situations, and to change direction when evidence suggests we're on the wrong path. Some people are just naturally flexible, but I'll also say that the pandemic has challenged even the most flexible people in more ways than one. However, this is an opportunity for leaders to examine how they're working and how the work environment is changing and how they're communicating with their employees. We need to be able to shift our mindsets as legislation and work practices evolve. Still, many of us are stuck in our ways. We're often not as agile as we think we are. If you believe great tools can fix any problem, if you rarely veer away from your structured plans and schedules, if you track hours but not progress, or you find yourself saying, here's what I think, much more often than you ask for others' opinions, you could probably use a flexibility boost. Here's how to get started. The more time you spend observing yourself and the people around you, the more you'll improve your flexibility. So try some experimentation. Notice, for example, how you approach different people. Is your style the same with each interaction you have, or do you respond to people differently, adjusting your approach as needed? To really understand another person, you need to tune in to what's going on beneath the surface. And we heard Dan describe how he does this in several of his interactions. Think about your daily routine. Do you do the same things every day with little variation? If so, Start small with driving or walking a different route to work, adding a new variation to your schedule, or just trying a new flavor of ice cream. Exposing yourself to different scenarios and getting out of your comfort zone will help you to become more flexible. Think about your agility. Are you open to new ideas, to new practices, or other points of view? Are you curious? We often think that we've taken multiple perspectives into consideration when in fact we're really aligning our beliefs and ideas with like-minded people or situations. This can lead to confirmation bias, so it's a slippery slope. Instead, find someone you don't have much in common with and ask them questions just to learn about them. Don't try to convince them of anything. Just listen with an open mind. Very few of us do this on a regular basis, and it helps us to suspend judgment, allowing us to use that information to respond in the moment, adjusting our behavior as needed. The more you accept our world is changing and you need to change with it, the more you'll put EQ to work. Thanks for listening to EQ at Work. Find us using the hashtag EQ at Work or visit our website eqatwork.net. Subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, Spreaker or your favourite podcast platform. We'd love you to leave a rating or review and if you have a moment, a simple share would be wonderful. Remember, tell your friends, mastering your emotions matters. Tune in next week for a special episode featuring one woman's story of simultaneous personal losses, which include her husband's incarceration, her job loss, and rebuilding her life and career as a single mother. 
It's a motivational and inspirational story, and one you won't want to miss.